Fan. Nine. Eight. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Fire. Ignition. Lift off. Aries one X. Testing concepts. Jimmy Doolittle, most considered the greatest flyer that ever lived. He set more flying records, he held more flying achievements, and he was awarded more medals than any flyer in history. Jimmy is best remembered, and sometimes only remembered, for leading an impossible raid on Japan, a raid that many feel was a suicide raid, soon after they bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. Pearl Harbor was then, and is now, one of the darkest days in American history. The attack was led by Admiral Isoruku Yamamoto, who was able to move his aircraft carriers a scant 256 miles off the coast of Hawaii, while the United States military slumbered in blissful ignorance. The attack was sudden and deadly, and the losses were staggering. In two horrifying hours, 2,338 people were killed. Over 1,000 alone by just one bomb when it breached the deck of the USS Arizona or the ammo magazine. An additional 1,144 men were wounded. Over half the Navy's ships destroyed or damaged. 188 airplanes were reduced to cinders before they even had a chance to get off the ground. America was in a state of shock, and in the months to come there were more demoralizing defeats at the hands of the Japanese military. Soon, that shock turned to anger. When are we going to strike back, people were asking. That question was answered on April 18, 1942, when Jimmy Doolittle led a daring raid against Japan. It was America's first victory of World War II. It was also a message to the rest of the world that America was not just a frightened country on the other side of the ocean, but a force to be reckoned with. News of the raid electrified people. There was mayhem in the streets of America. Jimmy was already well known for his flying achievements. But never has anyone become a national hero of such magnitude. It was as if nothing the man did before or after mattered. Over the years, many films have been made on just that one event. Actors such as Robert Redford, Clark Gable, Spencer Tracy, Alec Baldwin, have all portrayed Doolittle. But in reality, leading that raid on Tokyo was just another day in this man's incredible life. Welcome to Wings of a Warrior, the Jimmy Doolittle story. Oh, Doolittle would earn his doctorate at MIT. His formal education started right here, one room schoolhouse in Nome, Alaska. James Harold Doolittle was born in Alameda, California on December 14, 1898. Jimmy's father, Frank, a carpenter by trade, had tried many ways to make his fortune and the lure of the Alaskan gold rush was just too much to resist. So, at the tender age of three, Jimmy and family moved to Nome, Alaska. At the turn of the century, Nome, Alaska was one of the toughest towns in the world. There was no organized law, and it had as many saloons and whorehouses as it did stores. Hardly the place a mother would choose to raise her son. The locals resented newcomers flocking to their town in search of gold, and life was hard for the Doolittle family. 
Even at the age of five, Jimmy found himself in daily fights just to get to and from school. He developed a reputation of a scrapper that wouldn't back down. When Jim was seven, his father gave him a single-shot twenty-two rifle. One day he spotted a duck sitting in a mud puddle at the end of town. Jimmy, having seen a local native Alaskan hunt, he crawled up to the puddle on his belly and shot the duck. The rest of the day, the great Alaskan hunter paraded up and down the streets of Nome. Twenty-two rifle in one hand and the duck in the other. Jimmy was settling into the primitive frontier life, and his mother wasn't happy about it. Jimmy remembers the day he made the shocking discovery there was more to life than the muddy streets of Nome, Alaska, surrounded by nothing but sea, snow, and ice. His father took him on a long trek to Seattle to buy supplies. He was overwhelmed with the tall buildings, some automobiles, some trolleys, stores. He was even surprised to find that people actually painted their houses. The difference between lawless, crude gnome and the progressive Seattle left a lasting impression on the young Doolittle. He saw it as a future, and he wanted to be a part of it. While Jimmy was in Nome, Alaska, two brothers named Orville and Wilbur were unknowingly setting the stage for his future when they flew a strange-looking aircraft off the white sands of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. After eight years of brutal Alaskan hardship, Rosa Doolittle moved back to Los Angeles, California to give her son a proper education. Jim's father accompanied them, but soon returned to Alaska. The years growing up in Los Angeles would not only define who Doolittle was, but what he was to become. Luckily for the world, he wasn't cut out to be a farmer. He would also meet the two loves of his life, a girl named Josephine Daniels and Flynn, and he would marry both of them. While attending Manual Arts High School, Jim met Josephine Daniels, or Joe as she was called. She was from a southern family on a social level considered somewhat higher than the Doolittles. Jim was attracted to her even though he considered her a little snobbish at times. And she regarded him as an aimless roughneck that spent most of his time fighting or crashing his motorcycle. Joe got straight A's and was preparing for a career in library work. And Doolittle? Well, he was rarely seen carrying a book and appeared to have no idea what he was preparing for. So, of course, they fell in love. It was not exactly a whirlwind courtship. It would take Joe seven years to say yes to marrying Jim. Jimmy's love affair with flying started with seeing an air show and a dog-eared copy of Popular Mechanics. From it, he built a full-scale glider. The article simply stated, How to Build a Glider. It was actually a hand glider with the pilot's feet being the landing gear, and it was huge, with an 18-foot wingspan. Building it was easy for the mechanically minded Doolittle. Get into fly was another story. According to the directions, all that was needed was a high spot to jump off of and a low spot to land, and one would glide like a bird. Not quite that easy. The first attempt ended with a badly bruised body and a busted up glider. After repairs were made, Jimmy tried another method to gain more speed, being towed by a truck. So here we have Jimmy Doolittle racing madly behind this truck until the truck's speed exceeds his speed, then being yanked off his feet and dragged along with his glider into a pile of rubble. Not quite the start you'd expect from someone who'd go on to become the world's greatest flyer. But Jimmy was determined. He decided the way to get more speed was to install a motorcycle engine on the glider. But a storm destroyed the new glider the night before he tested it. Jimmy took that as an omen and decided to put his flying career on hold for a while. Years later, he learned if he had tested a new glider, it probably would have killed him. There was no money to spare in the Doolittle household, so Jimmy earned the money to build a glider by boxing in the gin mills of Los Angeles. He didn't want his mother to know how he was earning the money, so he fought under an assumed name. If he won the fight, he received a gold watch, which he sold back to the promoter for $5. After graduating from Manual Arts High School in Los Angeles, Doolittle spent a year at junior college, then went on to the University of California, where he studied mining engineering. While at Cal, Jim became an outstanding gymnast. 
He also put his early fighting skills to work and tried out for Cal's boxing team. He weighed 130 pounds and was sold to lightweight and welterweight spots on the team were filled, but they needed a middleweight. That's 160 pounds. That was just fine with Doolittle. He had already proved if he could hit someone, he could knock them out, no matter how big they were. He not only made the team as a middleweight, but went on to become the conference champion. As a mining and engineering student at the University of California, he landed a summer job at the legendary Virginia City Silver Mines. He wanted to learn about mining they didn't teach in books. The famous Comstock Lode, the largest silver strike in American history. It also played a big part in Nevada becoming the 36th State of the Union. For decades, it drew miners from all over the country looking to make their fortune. To Jim, it was like Nome, Alaska all over again. Most miners had long given up on striking it rich and were working for hard wages for the mining companies. They resented newcomers, especially college kids. But they would soon learn that Jim Doolittle was not your typical college kid. One day he waded through scalding hot water to restart a pump to keep the mine from flooding. On another occasion he was working at the 2,300 foot level when startled by the screams of miners and a runaway ore basket rocketing down a shaft crashing 200 feet below. Its cable had snapped. Jimmy volunteered to be lowered into the airless shaft to retrieve the bodies of the dead men. Halfway down, his hat candle flickered out. He was running out of air. Other miners directed a fire hose down the shaft to try and get more oxygen to the gasping Doolittle. Finally, a new cable was attached and Jimmy and the dead miners were pulled out. The college kid had become a rock hard miner. In 1917, America joined the First World War, a war to end all wars. So Doolittle did what most men were doing. He joined the Army. Or to be more exact, he joined the Army Reserve Signal Corps Aviation Section. Years later, it would be the Air Force. While patriotism was at a fever pitch across the land, most didn't really know what they were fighting for or against. Jimmy's reasoning was a little more realistic. He wanted to impress Joe Daniels' parents, who thought she could do a lot better than a kid from the wrong side of the track that came visiting on a motorcycle. And of course, he wanted to be where the action was. Despite what the parents thought, Jimmy and Joe were married Christmas Eve, 1917. Two days later, he was called to active duty at Rockville Field, San Diego, California. By today's standards, the plane Doolittle learned to fly in, the Thomas Morse JN-4, or Jenny, as it was affectionately called, wasn't much to look at, but to Jim, it was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen. Soon the world would learn that when James Harold Doolittle climbed into an airplane, anything could and did happen. It was no different on his very first flight. As Jim waited in his Jenny trainer to take off, two planes collided in midair and crashed on the runway directly in front of him. Jim and his instructor helped pull the dead and injured from the wreckage. The experience was enough to bring most young cadets to their knees. When the instructor asked if he was okay to continue with the lesson, Jim simply replied, Of course. Cold? You bet. But Jimmy was the original Iceman and it was his Iceman's approach to flying that would keep him and many others alive in the years to come. After we finished his flight training, he came face to face with the realization that the Army was producing more pilots than airplanes. So he was transferred to Camp Dick, where they had no airplanes. Why? To paint barracks, of course. After honing his skills as a house painter, trash collector, and maintenance man, Duell was sent to Wright Field, Ohio to study engine repair. He was getting closer. Then on the Gerstner Field in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Now Gerstner was known for its heat, mosquitoes, poor sanitation, and bumpy airstrip. But to Jim it was heaven. It had airplanes. Not the Jennies he had learned to fly in, but the newer, sleeker, Thomas Morse F-4C Scout. They were 30% faster than the Jenny and about 500% more dangerous. At the end of the day, when most pilots were enjoying a beer at the officers club, Jimmy would still be flying, 
making a plane do things he was told it wasn't designed for. But Doolittle's little chunk of heaven was abruptly brought to an end when a hurricane destroyed the field and most of the planes on it. It also killed several pilots. It's ironic that at about the same time, another pilot named James Doolittle was killed in Buffalo, New York. So an overzealous reporter, in keeping with getting a news story at all costs, called Joe Doolittle to get her reaction on Jimmy's death. Nice. She spent an agonizing 10 hours thinking her husband was dead. The storm that destroyed Gerstner Field also destroyed Jimmy's hopes of seeing action overseas. The war was ending. He was sent to Rockwell Field as an instructor. The commander at Rockwell Field was Colonel Harvey Burwell. He believed in doing everything by the book. Jimmy believed rules were meant to be bent. So forced the two formed an instant dislike for each other, kept alive by Jim constantly requesting to be transferred, and Burwell constantly denying the request. One time the filmmaker, Cecil B. DeMille, came to Rockwell Field to film planes taking off and landing. When Burwell reviewed the footage, he was shocked to see Jimmy casually sitting on the plane coming in for a landing. Jim is also one of the first to fool around with wing walking. On another occasion, Jimmy actually flew his plane through an open hangar to help a ground crew sweep it out. But Jim wasn't always a prankster. One time he went to Colonel Burwell with a plan to lead a flight from Rockwell Field to Washington, D.C. to deliver a message to the brass. The effect would not only join a major air base with the U.S. Capitol, but to show the reliability of the airplane. To Burwell's surprise, Dula had finally come up with a good idea. To Jim's surprise, his plan was approved. The little three-plane Almada started out in high spirits, and things went well until the end of the first day. The airfield they expected to find in Needles, California, had long ago dried up, and one of the planes was lost when it hit a pile of rocks while landing in the desert. The next day, things got worse. After putting the pilot on a train back to Rockwell Field, Jimmy and the other pilot found a nice paved road to take off from. Jim got off okay, but the other pilot's wingtip caught a foam pole and spun him into the ground, destroying the plane. They didn't have radios in planes in those days, so Jim had to find a general store with a phone in it and call Harvey Burwell with the bad news. Burwell told him to get back to Rockwell Field while they still had an airplane left and before he hurt himself. But the misadventures still weren't over. On the way back, Jim ran into dense fog and was forced to land in a newly plowed field. A wheel caught a soft spot and a plane flipped on its back. He was unhurt, but he was covered in oil and his uniform was torn up. The plane was undamaged, and the following day he managed to make it back to Rockwell. He was ordered to report to Colonel Burwell as soon as he landed. Jimmy stood at attention in front of the Colonel's desk in his oil-soaked, tattered uniform being balled out for just about everything. He finally saluted crisply, turned on his heels, and left the room. Jim forgot the seat of his pants had been ripped open in the accident, exposing his bare backside to Burwell. Of course, Burwell took this as a silent statement as to what Doolittle thought of him, and no amount of explaining ever changed his mind. Up until then, Lieutenant James Doolittle had destroyed three planes at a cost of $30,000. A few weeks later, Jimmy wiped out his fourth plane trying to catch a goose. The goose won. One of the training techniques Jim used to practice whenever the situation arose was to chase geese. For the most part, they would fly straight and about the same speed as the Jenny. Staying close to one was a challenge, also highly against the rules. But Jim had a theory about the rules. This particular goose, after gaining Doolittle's full attention and tired of his antics, flew him into an abrupt blind canyon with a sheer cliff. Jim managed to get most of the plane over the rim, except for the tail section. His artful crash landing kept him and his flying partner alive, but the plane was a total wipeout. This ante cost Jim more grounded time. In fact, during the five months he was at Rockwell Field under the watchful eye of Harvey Burwell, 
He was grounded a total of one and a half months and restricted to base a total of three months. Years later, Jimmy would explain some of his antics at Rockwell Field by saying, I had a lot of blood running through my veins at the time. He had a reputation as a hell-raising maverick, and he was. But he also took his job very seriously, and he was one of the best instructors in the service, and it wasn't always fun. One day, Jimmy was taking off in his plane, and his student was in the other plane, and the rules of flight at the time, for obvious reasons, is that the plane on the left would lift off to the left, and the plane on the right would lift off to the right. For some unexplained reason, the student veered in front of Jimmy, and his prop cut off the student's tail section. The student dived in, crashing, killing him. In another training flight, Jim was with a student pilot when the plane suddenly jumped and there was a crashing sound. The prop started shuddering so violently it threatened to tear the motor out of the plane. Doolittle shut the engine off, checking to see what had happened. Looking down, he saw a scout in flames, spouring earthward. Evidently, the pilot had approached Jim's plane from below, being blocked out by the blind spot created by his wings. The collision tore away Jimmy's landing gear and badly damaged the lower wing. Doolittle was left with an aircraft with no motor and a lower wing threatening to tear off at any moment. The only certainty was he was going down. Fast. He had some glide left in the plane that presented three options. He could wrap a wing around the tree to help soften the impact of the crash. He could side slip it in and let the fuselage absorb the impact. Or he could try and find a flat spot and attempt a belly landing. He chose to slide the plane in on its belly and landed safely. Doolittle finally got out of the doghouse with Burwell when a group of English government officials visited Rockwell Field. Unknown to Colonel Burwell, Doolittle and some buddies had been practicing close formation stunt flying. This was unheard of in 1917. Unlike the sleek, dependable planes of the day, the early biplanes were a menace to the best of pilots. Close formation flying was considered suicidal. Jimmy and his men put on an unannounced show for the surprise Colonel Burwell and the English officials. Afterwards, they congratulated Burwell on his fine training methods. War ended shortly afterwards, and Colonel Burwell was replaced by a man named H. H. Arnold. Years later, he had become famous as Cap Arnold, Supreme Commander of the Air Force during World War II. In 1918, most people still considered the airplane a toy. Unfortunately, the United States government agreed with them. And why not? Look at it. Looks like a haystack with a bad hair day. But what most people didn't understand is the same physics of lift, drag, etc., that would keep something like this in the air, and a few short years later, would keep something like this in the air. Now, if that short time span seems mind-boggling, consider this. Cap Arnold, the Supreme Commander of the Air Force during World War II, was actually taught to fly by the Wright brothers. After the war, the Air Service struggled to keep from being disbanded, which was mind-boggling considering most countries in the world quickly set about making huge advancements in the airplane. Even newly defeated Germany was experimenting with commercial air travel. But America was still a young, short-sighted country more interested in developing wealth than the airplane. But a few far-sighted leaders were able to find work for the air service. One was patrolling a forest looking for forest fires, and another was patrolling the border between the United States and Mexico looking for Mexicans. There had been reports of raids on ranches along the Texas border, and there had been cases of smuggling. So the Border Patrol was formed, and Doolittle found himself in a wide spot in the Texas desert called Eagle Pass. There was no real base there, so the men lived out of tents. Their patrol planes used were the DH-4s, nicknamed the Flying Coffins, because problems with the fuel systems had turned them into just that on occasions. The border was patrolled from Brownville, Texas, along the Rio Grande River to El Paso and on to San Diego. Because of tensions between the United States and Mexico at the time, they were instructed to never fire their guns, even when fired upon by bandits. The duty was boring, and for the most part, a waste of time but it was not without its moments. Once in a while, Jim's guns would accidentally fire and accidentally hit a deer. 
and the venison just happened to be a welcome change from the mess hall food. While they had been instructed not to shoot back at bandits, that didn't mean they couldn't fight back. On more than one occasion, when fired upon, Jim would round up a nearby herd of cattle with his plane and stampede them through the screaming bandits. Jack Allard, a lifelong friend of Jim's, related a story about the perils of flying with the mischievous Doolittle. He had reached the end of a run, and he dipped his wing to bank left. The plane didn't respond. Again he tried. Again nothing. He looked out to his right, and there was Jimmy grinning back at him. Doolittle had placed his wingtip over Aller's wingtip to keep him from banking. Probably a maneuver they frowned upon at flight school. In 1920, Jimmy took part in General Billy Mitchell's amazing demonstration of sinking a battleship from the air. For years, the outspoken Mitchell had been telling anyone that would listen that the airplane was the future of the military. He amazingly predicted the Japanese would attack Pearl Harbor and that air power, not naval power, would be the deciding factor in all battles and wars. Japan proved that at Pearl Harbor, and the U.S. proved it soon afterwards at the Battle of Midway. Since the Navy had been the backbone of the military for 200 years, this caused quite a bit of backlash. And when Mitchell boasted an airplane could sink a battleship from the air, the press jumped in the middle of it until a demonstration was arranged. Even after Billy Mitchell prevailed, sending an unsinkable German battleship to the bottom of six 2,000-pound bombs, Congress was not allocated a future to the Air Force. Back then, as is true today, politics played a bigger part in the decision-making than common sense. Mitchell continued his bolsterous criticism of not only the government, but the military, until in 1925 he talked his way into a court martial. Working with Billy Mitchell inspired Doolittle. Even though the act of sinking a battleship appeared to accomplish little at the time, the fact that it had been done couldn't be ignored, not by the Navy or not by the Congress. And Doolittle also reasoned that if a plane could carry 4,000 pounds of bombs, why not 4,000 pounds of cargo or 4,000 pounds of passengers? The one event that catapulted Jimmy Doolittle into national prominence got off to a not-so-prominent start. In 1922, he planned to make a transcontinental flight from Florida to California, stopping only once in Texas to refuel. He used the beaches at Pablo Beach, Florida as his starting point. As he raced his de Havilland 4 down the beach, a wheel caught a soft spot in the sand catapulted in the plane into the water. Jim was unhurt, but the impact of the crash pulled his flying helmet down over his eyes. This, and the fact that he was strapped in, upside down and underwater, was cause for concern. Jim unbuckled and was thrashing about to escape when he discovered he was only knee-deep in water. The crowd laughed, applauding Doolittle's heroic effort. A month later, after getting the plane back in flying condition, Jim was back on the sands of Pablo Beach. This time, a row of lanterns were set up to help you find the runway of hard-packed sands. Jimmy lifted off without incident, and 22 hours and 19 minutes later, he sat down in San Diego, California, becoming the first person in history to cross the continent in less than a day. That same year, Jimmy set the undesirable record of the world's shortest parachute jump. Airplane manufacturers consider Doolittle the ultimate test of their product. If it could withstand him, it could withstand anything. On a test flight over McCookfield, Ohio, the plane broke up under him. And while his horrified wife and young son looked on, the chute opened a beat before he hit the ground. In 1923, the military knew they had more than just an airplane flyer in their midst and sent Doolittle to MIT to study aeronautical engineering. At the time, there was a giant gap in communication between aeronautical scientists and pilots. The pilots didn't put much faith in flying an airplane with a slide rule and an algebra book. And the scientists? Well, they thought most flyers were just flat crazy anyway for wanting to fly around in cracker boxes. 
Doolittle received not only his master's degree, but went on to earn his doctorate as well. During a break in his studies, Doolittle delivered a plane to the Boston airport. It was night when he made his seaward approach, his wheels almost touching the whitecaps. There were no lights or communications at the Boston airport in 1924, so Jim wanted to set down as soon as he cleared the seawall. Night landing at Boston were rare, so the men working on the field that day thought nothing of leaving a three-foot pile of cinders at the end of the runway. Besides, they reasoned that nobody could land that close to the seawall anyway. Jimmy came in and cleared the seawall with inches to spare and instantly felt his plane being torn apart. He bounced across the runway, came to a halt, he climbed out unhurt, and in typical Doolittle fashion, instead of cursing the men for leaving the cinders there, he silently blessed them for not leaving the greater two. To attract attention to the upcoming Schneider Cup race, Jimmy flew his Curtis R3C racer among the skyscrapers of New York at near street level altitude. That wouldn't go over too well today. In fact, it didn't go over too well then. The next day, he set a new record of 232 miles per hour in winning the race. But that speed record of 232 miles per hour seems a little timid. It was the overall average speed, which included slowing down to make 180 degree turns around pylons. Also, consider this. The top speed the plane Doolittle learned to fly in only six years earlier was a whopping 70 miles an hour, wide open. Jimmy pulled out his old MIT slide rule to help win that race. He adjusted the pitch of the plane's propeller to increase engine speed, and he designed a different angle to approach the pylons to get around them quicker. The Schneider Cup race was flown in seaplanes. Jimmy flew for the Army. The Navy wasn't overly thrilled he had beaten their pilots. He further rubbed salt in the Navy's wounds. When Jim returned to McCook Field, he was given a parade through downtown Dayton, Ohio. He was issued a Navy uniform and his car was decorated to look like a ship. The sign on the side of the car read, Admiral Jimmy Doolittle. For some reason, the Navy didn't think that was very funny. Six months later, he would be awarded the coveted Mackey Trophy as the outstanding flyer in the world. Jim would be the first person in the world to win the triple crown of racing for Schneider, the Bendix, and the Thompson. In 1926, Jim again made aviation history. On a test flight over Wright Field, Ohio, he was testing a new addition to the rudder called a trim tab. He was putting a plane through a series of stiff maneuvers when he heard a loud crack. The cable to the rudder had snapped. Now this would be like driving your car at 100 miles an hour and having a steering wheel come off in your hands. The procedure of the day was to quickly part company with your aircraft. Jimmy had a theory about landing a rudderless plane, and it was now or never. So from 5,000 feet, he literally stalled or floated the plane to the ground. And just before it crashed, he gave it full power and landed safely. The famous flyer, Charles Lindbergh, later told the press, Jimmy is the only pilot in the world that could have pulled that off. That same year, the Curtis Aircraft Company had a shot of selling planes to the Chilean military. So they went to the United States Army on bended knee, begged, and got Doolittle to demonstrate the plane for them. Jimmy was given a leave of absence without pay, which was more than fine with him, since the Curtis people paid a lot more than the Army. The plane to be demonstrated was their new pursuit plane, the P-1 Hawk Fighter. Germany, Italy, and England were also there trying to sell their planes. A few days before the demonstration, a cocktail party was held, and the local drinks were a big hit. You know the kind. They taste so good they can't possibly have that much alcohol. Party talk finally got around to the great American actor Douglas Fairbanks and his daring swashbuckling antics in movies. Jim ended up on a second story ledge outside a window imitating some of the moves of the famous actor. Not a problem for an ex-college gymnast. Until the lead gave way. Jimmy broke both angles in the fall. 
and to make matters worse, they cast him wrong at the hospital. Now, Jimmy would be the first to admit that he'd had a share of screw-ups in his life, and this ranked right up there at the top. He let himself down. Now, this demonstration meant a lot to the Curtis Wright people and to the United States government, and there was no way he was letting them down. The day of the demonstration, the huge crowd was shocked to see an ambulance roar up on the field and deliver Doolittle on crutches, both legs in cast. He was lifted into his plane where his casted feet were wired to the rudder pedals. Jimmy lifted the P-1 Hawk into the air and put on an incredible show. In the process, breaking both casts, he felt agonizing pain each time he moved a rudder pedal. The next demonstration was by Ernest von Schulenbeck, one of Germany's greatest aces. He fought with the famed Richterfern squadron during World War I. As Jimmy watched from his plane, he decided he wasn't quite done with his demonstration. He nodded to a delighted crewman, I'm going back up. He joined the German at 4,000 feet, dipping his wings, and made a path to show his intent. For the next 10 minutes, they engaged in a mock dogfight where Doolittle literally flew circles around the famous ace. Finally, von Schoenbeck had had enough. He broke off and landed his plane. Jimmy followed him in, but just before touching down, he flipped the plane on its back and buzzed the field upside down. The crowd went wild and engulfed his plane when he landed. Doolittle appreciated the joyous crowd, but feared they'd try and pull him out of his plane with his feet so wired to the rudders. Respectful von Schoenbeck conceded it was the greatest exhibition of flying ever displayed. Not bad for a kid that trashed his first glider. When Jim returned to the States from his window ledge antics, it cost him six months in Walter Reed Hospital. It gave him plenty of time to think about a flying feat that had never been accomplished, the outside loop. Now in the conventional loop, the plane goes up and over, and the pilot is forced down into the seat. In the outside loop, it's just the opposite. The plane goes up, down, and around. And the medical consensus of the day is that Blood vessels would burst and vital organs could be ripped loose from the body. Many flyers had attempted the outside loop. They'd all failed or died trying. Jimmy had studied the structural design of the Curtis Hawk and was confident it would withstand the stress. He was almost as confident his body would. On a clear day, 10,000 feet over Wright Field, Ohio, Jimmy nosed the Hawk over into a vertical dive. At 285 miles per hour, he jammed the stick forward and once again flew into the history books, proving the experts wrong. When reporters asked why he tried such a suicidal feat, he answered slyly, it was just a spur of the moment thing. The military, while welcoming advancements in flight technology, was fully aware Jim Doolittle was not your average pilot. For fear there would be a host of other pilots killing themselves trying the outside loop, the military issued orders forbidding anyone from attempting it. Of all of Jimmy Doolittle's achievements and contributions to flying, he considered blind flying one of the most important. Most pilots of the day thought when flying in fog or bad weather they could feel or just know the direction and disposition of their flight. They were wrong. In many cases, dead wrong, and Doolittle proved it. Fog was understandably the number one weather hazard to land in an airplane. Many solutions had been tried. Hail drags, weighted lines lowered from the plane, different types of sonar equipment, dispensing fog with heat, all had some but limited effects. What was needed was a precision land altimeter, distance from the aircraft to the ground, and a device that would give the correct attitude of the airplane. This meaning the landing gear and the tail skid had to be level with the ground. Coming in with a wing down would spell disaster. Working closely with the Guggenheimer Flight Laboratory and using his scientific background, Jim helped design the instruments needed to navigate in bad weather. On September 24, 1929 at Mitchell Field, New York, a hood was fastened over the cockpit of his constellated NY-2 biplane and he became the first person in history to take off, fly, and land using instruments only. Many of the instruments and concepts he designed are still in use today. Jimmy's achievements with blind flying were dearly threatened while working on the project. 
The promoters of the national air races have been after Doolittle for some time to make an appearance and thrill the crowd with some of his daredevil flying. Jimmy felt he had more important things to do at the time and was slow committing. Finally, the head of the Air Corps called and strongly suggested he make an appearance. The day before the show, Doolittle climbed into a P-1 Hawk fighter to get a little practice. He was putting the fighter through some stiff maneuvers when suddenly a wing snapped off. When a wing breaks off your plane, there's only one decision to make and not a whole lot of time to think about it. Jim unbuckled and as he spiraled through space was ejected from the plane. Doolittle was picked up by a jeep and taken back to the field. He walked into the headquarters with a parachute wadded up under his arm, and a shocked friend asked, What happened? And Jimmy replied, My plane broke up. And his friend said, Did you get out okay? One day, out of the skies of Wichita, Kansas, Jimmy was experimenting with a new flying concept, retractable landing gear. They worked just fine until they landed. Then they malfunctioned. Once again, Doolittle walked away from a devastating crash. In 1932, on another record-setting flight from Canada to Mexico City, Jim climbed to 19,000 feet to get over the Andes Mountains. He suddenly became very drowsy. It worsened until he was on the verge of passing out. Twice he lost control and had to pull the plane out of steep dives. He started reciting well-known dates out loud. If he could remember one, he would bail out. Not the ideal thing to do at 19,000 feet over the Andes. Might as well leave your parachute in the plane. Acting out of sheer instinct, he managed to land in Mexico City before passing out. The following day, he learned the cause of his near death. Jim always carried two cans of tetraethyl lead in case he had to refuel with unleaded gasoline. 19,000 feet, the seam on one of the cans had split open, filling the cockpit with toxic fumes. By 1932, Jim had set, or broken, just about every flying record there was. He had even managed to tame the legendary GB Sportster, or the Killer Plane as it was most often called. The plane was named after the Granville brothers, who started out as auto mechanics, then got into airplane design, and they were good at it. Maybe too good. Jim told me that flying the GB was like balancing a pencil on your finger. One lapse of concentration and it was gone. The GB had killed many flyers that had suffered that lapse of concentration, including its designer. Some considered it the most dangerous plane ever built. Others thought it was just too advanced for most pilots to handle. Doolittle won the Bendix Speed Race in a record 252 miles per hour, even lapping the competition. After setting the record, Jim simply said, it flew like a bullet, a perfect description of a 1400 horsepower engine designed to resemble an airplane. Jimmy abruptly quit racing after that. When asked why, he related stories of Rebecca going to the well once too often, or he'd never known a racing pilot die of old age. But it was more than that. Jim learned that when he was racing the GB, the media would train cameras on his wife and children to get their reaction if he crashed. In all of Jim Doolittle's spills, thrills and brushes with disaster. He considered the luckiest day of his life the day he met his wife, Jo. She brought stability and meaning into the life of a young, restless hellraiser. Doolittle had no doubt that without her support, he wouldn't have accomplished nearly what he did in life. She gave him two sons, Jim Jr., October 2nd, 1920, and John, June 29th, 1922. Joe ran a flawless household from managing the family budget to whipping up dinner for three or four unexpected guests Jim might bring home. Many times when Jim was required to be away for extended periods of time, Joe stepped in as both mother and father without missing a beat. All this while being ready to move halfway across the country on a day's notice, which the Doolittles did on a regular basis. Jimmy was known for a sense of humor and always tried to keep life in perspective. But there were times he could lose that sense of humor in a big hurry, especially if he felt he had been wrong. Then it could be hell on wheels. Joe was always there to give advice, if asked, or help calm jangled nerves. She was a catalyst of the Doolittle family, and Jimmy wasn't going to let his family's last memory of him be an airplane exploding into a ball of fire.
Jim had been in the public eye for a long time, but he'd never experienced anything that disgusting. He was irate. Doolittle wasn't one for bragging about his accomplishments or heroic deeds, but he did get a chuckle talking about some of his lesser accomplishments. One of those was in the Dutch East Indies in 1933. While Doolittle was demonstrating planes with the Curtis Wright people, the commander of the Dutch Air Force asked him to put one of their own planes through its paces, hoping to learn something from the great flyer. Jim agreed. He put the plane into a dive, and at 1,000 feet began to pull out, not knowing the heavy Dutch plane needed at least 1,000 feet to pull out of a dive. Jim instantly knew he was in trouble. At the bottom of the dive, the plane's wheels actually hit the ground before arching upward. The Dutch general complimented Jim's wife on her husband's remarkable show of skill. But Joe knew different. All she could do is smile politely through clenched teeth. Just another day at the office for Jim. In the 1930s, the world was in a Great Depression, and each country was handling it in a different way. In America, people were put to work building dams, bridges, and roads. In Japan, people were put to work building up the military and trying to unite the nations of East Asia, by force if necessary. In Germany, a guy named Adolf Hitler was giving speeches about German pride and dignity. At the request of the government, Doolittle toured many countries in Europe and Asia. He was shocked. Not only the buildup in the armies, but the superiority of their aircraft. Based on what he saw, Jim was convinced war was on the horizon, and when it came, he was just as convinced it would be one on the air. The United States Air Force lagged way behind the progress of other countries. Jimmy was very vocal about the need to build up a proper Air Force. Luckily, President Roosevelt agreed with him. Jim took a leave from the military and worked closely with Shell's Oil Aviation Division. He convinced them to perfect 100 octane gasoline, which was quite a gamble on both their parts. There were those who questioned the need for octane that high and the wisdom of producing it. The first gallon of 100 octane gasoline cost Shell $1 million, and some referred to it as Doolittle's million dollar blunder. During the war, it greatly increased not only the speed, but the range of Allied aircraft. England credited their victory in the Battle of Britain to having 100 octane fuel, while the Germans still only had 87 octane. In 1940, Hap Arnold sent for Jimmy Doolittle. He wanted him back in uniform. But whatever plans he had for Jim changed drastically on December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. Some historians have given Jim the credit for conceiving a raid on Japan. That isn't true. It was conceived by Captain Francis Lowell, Assistant Chief of Staff for Anti-Submarine Warfare. While flying out of Norfolk, Virginia, he saw the shadow of his plane pass over the outline of an aircraft carrier painted on the field below, used for training purposes. Cap Arnold put Doolittle in charge of the project because he considered him the only man on the planet that could figure out how to get a loaded bomber off the deck of an aircraft carrier. Normally the B-25 required 2,000 feet to get airborne. Jim was given 500 feet to work with. Jim chose the untested B-25 for a very elementary reason. It was carrier friendly, meaning it was the only bomber with a short enough wingspan to clear the command tower. The B-25 had to be completely modified to get the job done. It was going to take off in a short space and fly a long way. Everything from extra gas tanks made of rubber to a new bomb site so the secret Norton bomb site wouldn't fall into enemy hands. Broomsticks would eventually replace some of the guns to help lighten the load and hopefully fool enemy fighter planes. And of course the engines had to run better than a Swiss watch which almost required carburetors that hadn't been invented yet. The mission was top secret, of course, and Hap Arnold gave Doolittle a letter giving him top priority over any officer in the Army Air Force. He only had to use it once, when a power-hungry commander upset over the special treatment they were receiving wouldn't allow them to leave until Jim signed a mountain of forms about the quality of service received while training at that field. All this while his men waited in their planes to take off. The guy had been in real pain while they were training at that field. 
causing Doolittle a lot of problems he really didn't need at the time. Jimmy scribbled the word lousy across the top form, climbed into his plane, and took off. He buzzed the field at treetop level, and his crew followed him and did the same thing. Highly against the rules at the time, but it was their way of saying thank you to the ground crewman for a job well done. The commander commented to one of his aides that uh, that Doolittle was heading for a lot of trouble. Little did he know. Originally, Jimmy was only brought in to deal with flying a bomber off an aircraft carrier and training the crews, not leading the mission. One day, Jim went into Half Arnold's office and presented his case for leading the mission. Arnold flatly said, no, explaining Jim couldn't lead every mission he's involved in planning. But Doolittle kept hammering away until Hap finally said it was all right with him if it was okay with Miff Harmon his chief of staff. As Jim left the office, he smelled a rat, feeling Arnold was just passing the buck. He sprinted down the hall and burst into Harmon's office, blurting out what Arnold had told him. Harmon, not wanting to override his boss's decision, shrugged and said, fine, Jim, you can lead the mission. As Jimmy was closing the door, he heard the phone ring, and then Harmon saying, but Hap, I already gave you my permission. Hap Arnold had underestimated Jimmy's foot speed. Before training ever started, Jimmy told the men that the mission was highly dangerous and the fatality rate could be 100%. That kind of says it all. He also told them that anyone wanted to drop out at any time, any place, anywhere could, no questions asked. Nobody did. On April 1, 1942, in Alameda Port, California, 16 of the original 24 bombers were loaded on the aircraft carrier Hornet. The next day, they headed up the coast to San Francisco. Did the Japanese know something was up? Well, sure they did. They had spies just like we did. But never in their wildest dream did they think that those bombers were going to be blown off the deck of that aircraft carrier. They probably thought they were just being transported somewhere. And they were. They were being transported to Japan. The original plan was to get the Raiders within 400 miles of Japan before launching, bomb key military targets, then fly safely to pre-arranged locations in China. That didn't work. The Japanese, taking precautions against an attack, had moved their picket line of patrol boats 900 miles off the coast, way out of range of carrier-based fighter planes. At 6.30 a.m. Saturday, April 18, 1942, the general alarm sounded on the Hornet. They had been spotted by a patrol boat 823 miles off the coast of Japan. Another misconception about the raid is Doolittle made the decision to launch the planes. Not true. The task force was under the command of William Bull Halsey. The force consisted of two aircraft carriers, four cruisers, eight destroyers, and two tankers. Those were his boats. He commanded them, and everyone on them. His immediate concern was the safety of the task force, and after the beating at Pearl Harbor, he couldn't risk losing ships, especially the carriers. After being spotted by a patrol boat, he needed the B-25s off the deck of the Hornet to make room for his fighter planes that were stored below. They were either going to be flown off or pushed over the side. At that distance from the Japanese coast, the chances of the Raiders making it to China were slim. It was a difficult decision for Admiral Halsey. At 6.32 a.m., the order came. Launch. The aircraft carrier Hornet was pitching badly in a rough sea, and the winds were blowing at gale force proportions. Many of the crew doubted a B-25 could be flown off that undulating deck in 40 knot winds. Doolittle was the first to go. When his plane roared down the runway and lifted into the air, the cheers could be heard above the storm.
Jim would later describe his flight over Tokyo as routine. At the coast, he was met by five Japanese fighter planes, but lost them with some amazing evasive flying to the hill of Japan. Over the target, just as he was reassuring the crew that the flak was missing in a mile, a burst rocked the plane, causing Flight Chief Sergeant Paul Leonard to comment, Major, that was no mile. Obviously, Jim's concept of routine was different than others. With the help of a tailwind, the planes did make it to the China coast. One plane flew to Russia from Japan due to mechanical problems. Because of bad weather, and with the planes sputtering on their last gallon of gasoline, they were left with the choice of either bailing out or trying to crash land into the ocean. Doolittle let each plane crew make their own decision. After 13 hours in the air and traveling 2,250 miles, Jim made the decision to abandon ship somewhere over the China coast, he hoped. After the crew had jumped, he put the ship on automatic pilot, shut off both gas cocks, double-checked to make sure all the crew was gone, adjusted his chute, and in his words, left the airplane. As Jimmy descended through the dark rain, he thought about the once shattered angles and hoped for a landing that wouldn't damage them. He more than got his wish. He suddenly landed in a rice paddy, setting Nick deep in night soil a nicer name for human excrement. Later that night, seeking shelter from the chilling cold, Jimmy climbed into a large crate he came across suspended on two sawhorses. It turned out to be a coffin, occupied by an elderly man. Spending the night with a dead man was not a problem for Jim. Trying to stay warm in the cold weather was. He survived the night only to spend a nerve-wracking day with suspicious Chinese soldiers who suspected him of being a spy. Only after retrieving his parachute, a farmer had snatched from the rice paddy, did the soldiers believe him. After a frantic week locating his scattered crew, Jim was taken to Chongqing, where he met with General Isamo and Madame Cheng Kai Shek. Most of the crew survived. Eleven raiders were killed or captured, three executed by the Japanese. All the planes were lost. Jim felt he had failed. His first message to Hap Arnold simply said, Mission accomplished. Bad weather over China. Fear all planes lost but he had no idea of the worldwide impact of the raid, or what it did for the morale of American people who were literally celebrating in the streets. And Jim had no idea he would return to a hero's welcome and be given his country's highest award, the Congressional Medal of Honor. One day, soon after his return, Jimmy went into a drugstore to buy a tube of toothpaste. But he couldn't get it because he didn't have an empty in return, a metal-saving measure of the day. He tried to buy several other items, but was denied because of a shortage. Finally, the clerk repeated a popular phrase at the time, Don't you know there's a war on? Jimmy just smiled and said, Sorry, I've been away. Like any other world-changing event, there are those who serve just as bravely, sometimes go unnoticed. There was seaman Robert Wall, who lost his arm when wind surge pushed him into the prop of B-25 number 16 as it was preparing to launch. The surge plane on the Hornet crashed at sea, claiming the lives of pilot G.D. Randall and radio operator T.A. Gallagher. Then there were the Chinese people, a young man named Tung Shen Lu, who risked his life by hiding raiders from Japanese soldiers. 
He would be made an honorary raider and in 1947 moved to the United States where he became an aeronautical engineer. He retired in Monterey Park, California and passed away at the age of 92. But there were others who weren't quite so fortunate. In retaliation for helping the Raiders over a three-month period, the Japanese military systematically slaughtered 250,000 men, women, and children. That's a quarter of a million people. To what military end has never been disclosed. When Eisenhower asked Hap Arnold, recommend someone to organize and lead the 12th Air Force during the invasion of North Africa. Arnold said, Jim Doolittle. Ike met with Jim, and then wired Arnold, Doolittle not acceptable. He still considered him too much of a hotshot pilot and not enough of an organization man. But Hap was persistent and finally won out. Jimmy chose Hoyt Vandenberg as his chief of staff and General George Patton was in charge of the ground forces. As a general, Jim led over 20 missions, always over heavy black areas. This at a time when most leaders were commanding well out of harm's way. Every time he led a mission, morale skyrocketed and losses went down. One night in England, Jimmy and famed flying ace Eddie Rickenbacker were watching from a hillside apartment as the Germans bombed London. A large piece of flak landed on the deck near them, and Rickenbacker commented, The guy could get killed out here, Jim. Just then, a bomb exploded in the street in front of him, blowing him back through the glass doors of the apartment. Jim was bruised and battered, but his sense of humor was still intact. As he laid on the floor, he managed to grin and said, You know, Eddie, I think this is where we should have been in the first place. Jimmy had lost many friends during the war, and he'd hardened himself to deal with it. The loss of one particular man devastated him, Paul Leonard. Sergeant Paul Leonard, his flight chief sent the Tokyo raid. When Doolittle was sure he had failed after the raid, Leonard tried to cheer him up by saying that when he got back to the States, they would not only make him a general, but give him the Medal of Honor. He also told Jim that no matter where he went, he always wanted to be his flight chief. They developed a special bond and became close friends. Jimmy and his chief of personnel, Jack Allard, flew to an airfield to meet with his commander. Just after landing, the field came under attack and Doolittle and Allard had to make a mad dash through an exploding ammo dump. Their jeep pockmark was shrapnel. Jim returned to his plane to find it half covered in dirt and debris. Nearby, a group of men were standing around a large bomb crater. Jim picked up the remains of a hand with a watch still on the wrist. The description on the watch read, To Paul, with love. Paul Leonard had stayed in the plane long enough to shoot down a German fighter plane and took cover in a nearby ditch. The Germans tried to bomb Doolittle's plane but missed, hitting the ditch. Jimmy turned on his heels and climbed into the dirt-covered plane with Jack Allard close behind. After blowing the dirt off with the prop wire, she roared down the runway. It was not the right thing to do, nor the smart thing to do. The plane should have been checked out first. But Paul Leonard had done the smart thing by taking cover in the ditch. It didn't work out very well. The men on the field watched in stunned silence, most expecting the plane to cartwheel into a ball of flame. Jim nursed it into the air and then put it through a series of stiff maneuvers. He finally grunted to a petrified, respectful Jack Allard. Well. I guess the damn thing will still fly. When Jimmy commanded the 15th Air Force, he had the job of bombing Rome. And that's the same Rome that has churches, shrines, and the Vatican. Now, the rules of American warfare is you don't bomb the other guy's religious sites, especially when their religion is the same as yours. The last plane on a bombing mission is called Tail End Charlie. It rarely makes it through without taking a hit because the ground gunners have a chance to adjust. Over Rome, Jimmy flew the tail end Charlie spot because he wanted to make sure none of the churches were hit. And he wasn't a churchgoer. 
After a victory in North Africa, Doolittle was given command of the 8th Air Force in Europe. Jimmy's major enemy in England was the weather. Two out of three days were unflyable. On his first airstrike, the weather turned bad soon after it was launched. If the men had to return in that weather, it could mean the loss of half of them. A recall would mean his first 8th Air Force mission was a failure. It would mean the lives of 6,000 flying personnel would have been risked for nothing, and a million and a half gallons of gasoline wasted. Jim watched and waited, then gave the order. Recall. In 30 minutes, the weather changed and the men returned in clear weather. A week later, the exact same thing happened. The mission was launched, the weather turned bad, Jim ordered a recall, and then the weather turned clear. By now, most of the men in the 8th Air Force thought Jimmy Doolittle had lost it. As did General Spatz, the overall commander of the 8th Air Force in Europe. He called Jimmy into his office and flat told him, looks like you don't have the guts to run a big air force. The man didn't mince words. Jimmy explained about the freak changes in the weather and that missions that returned in bad weather routinely lost half their planes. And he didn't think either mission was worth 3,000 lives. General Spatz decided to tour Doolittle's air bases before making a decision about replacing him. As they flew from base to base, the weather was beautiful, as were the weather reports. But on the way back, the weather quickly changed, and they found themselves in dense fog, extending all the way to the ground. Jim was forced to make a blind landing. They bounced and skidded to a halt a few feet from a stone wall that would have destroyed the plane and killed the two highest-ranking generals in England. Badly shaken General Spatz told Jimmy he was absolutely right in recalling the missions. Jimmy Doolittle became the first Air Force commander in history to conduct a large-scale attack without a single loss. Over 6,000 men flying 800 bombers and 500 fighter planes. Running a big Air Force is not always about launching missions and winning battles. One day, two women came to Doolittle's office, a mother and her daughter, and said they had befriended one of his airmen, even loaning him their bicycle to make it easier for him to visit. And now he'd been transferred back to the States, and they were both pregnant. Jimmy assured them this is a very serious matter, and he'd have the airmen brought back to deal with it. And the women said, oh no, we don't want to get him in trouble. We just want our bicycle back. On June 6, 1944, in the rough choppy seas of the English Channel, Operation Overlord was launched, the code name for the Normandy invasion. 156,000 Allied troops from the United States, Britain, and Canada would storm ashore the beaches of Normandy to spearhead the beginning of the end of the Third Reich. One of the greatest fears over the landing beaches were enemy planes. There was nowhere to run and nowhere to hide. But the 8th Air Force had so thoroughly bombed gas dumps, ammo dumps, and airfields, the Germans couldn't get one plane in the air. When the invasion was launched, the reports were slow coming in, and mostly inaccurate. So Jimmy Doolittle climbed into a P-38 Lightning, and with a wingman, headed for the landing beaches to see for himself. Over the beaches, he spotted a hole in the clouds and zipped through it. His wingman missed it. He returned to give General Eisenhower the first eyewitness account of the invasion. Pike was grateful for the account, but horrified at the thought of one of his top generals buzzing the beaches in a fighter plane. He reminded Jim that chances were good he could have been shot down by his own troops. He also reminded him he needed a commander of the 8th Air Force more than he needed a hotshot pilot. If he wanted to return to the ranks of a fighter pilot, he could arrange it. Jim told me the reason he took a P-38 over the beaches is because it was the most recognizable plane in the service. He didn't want to get shot down either. He also told me of, of seeing landing craft taking direct hits and bodies flying through the air. It was surreal. In the last days of the war, 
Jimmy put together the biggest mission in history. 3,008 planes in one mission. I mean, when Doolittle first joined the service, there was 55 airplanes in the entire United States. Think about that. The effort literally brought the German war machine to a halt. As in any war, events happened and decisions were made that caused heartache and second guessing. During D-Day, bombers of the 8th Air Force inadvertently dropped bombs on their own troops, killing 100 and injuring over 500. There were 2,500 bombers involved in the operation, dropping thousands of bombs on mostly smoke-covered targets. The 8th had been trained for high-altitude bombing, not close to Fort of ground troops. But Jimmy took full responsibility for the tragedy because he was a man at the top. It was standard procedure to send bombing crews home after they had flown 25 missions. Jim increased that number to 35 missions. When a green crew came in, it took at least 10 missions before they knew what they were doing and how to stay alive. Many mishaps occurred during the first few missions. After that, they were much more seasoned. Jim felt it was counterproductive to replace a crew at the peak of their effectiveness. Another decision that earned him the nickname of Killer with bomber commanders and crews was to turn the fighter planes loose to seek and destroy enemy aircraft. Jimmy felt the fighter plane was meant to be an offensive weapon to destroy enemy aircraft when they found them. The longer the Germans had planes in the air, the longer the war would last. The primary function of the fighter planes had been to escort bombers to and from the targets. Bomber crews referred to fighters as their little buddies and relied heavily on them. Up until then, the bomber's strategy over the target was to drop their bombs and then get the hell out, hit for home as fast as they could. Stragglers that couldn't keep up due to damage or mechanical problems were easy targets for German fighter planes. But bombers were taught to fly tighter formations to protect not only themselves, but others. Also, the efficiency of the bomber gunners, as were their weapons, were improving. While bombers would still have fighter protection, it would be on a limited basis. It was sort of a lesser of two evils type decision. Did it cost the lives of more bombing crews? Yes. But the real question is, did it save more lives than it cost? Military historians, both German and American, estimate that Doolittle's handling of the 8th Air Force shortened the war by as much as a year. When the war in Europe was over, Jim was sent to Okinawa in the Pacific to join the flamboyant General Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur was well known for his outspoken opinions and his enormous ego. That would eventually end up getting him fired by President Harry Truman. Jim is still carrying the label of a hotshot pilot, and he is determined to keep a low profile. Let MacArthur have the glory. All Doolittle wanted was a war to be over. But upon his arrival, he was puzzled at MacArthur's cold reception, until an aide showed him a newspaper clipping from the London Times. Any long-range plans for Jim Doolittle in the Pacific War came to an abrupt halt on August 6, 1945. Three days later, a second bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. An explanation point, I guess. And what had started nearly four years earlier with hundreds of bombs, bullets, and airplanes, and it was just one bomb. 
equaling 20,000 tons of TNT. After the war, Jimmy became a vice president at Shell Oil and later became a director. His scientific background was invaluable in the advancement of space age fuels. In 1951, Jim was appointed special assistant to the Chief of Air Force as a civilian in scientific matters that helped bridge aerospace and ballistic missiles development. In 1954, then President Eisenhower asked Doolittle to do a study on the Central Intelligence Agency, which would become known as the Doolittle Report. The CIA had been formed a few years earlier in 1947 as primarily an information gathering agency. But as the threat of communism grew around the world, so did the duties of the CIA. Jim felt the game plan needed changing to combat the threat of communism. The act of fair play must be re-examined. America was in a different kind of war now and must adjust to a different kind of warfare. The report was very controversial and respected it voiced opinions not normally associated with a democratic society. The days of glorifying war were coming to an end. Jim retired from the service in 1959, but remained actively involved, becoming chairman of the board of Space Technology Laboratories. He also remained a special advisor to the Air Force. Jim's two sons, Jim Jr. and John, followed in Dad's footsteps and became flyers. Jim Jr. served in the Pacific in a medium bomber squadron, and also as a bomber pilot with the 9th Air Force where he was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. He also served in Korea as a fighter pilot, and later as a test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base. John Doolittle attended West Point. He was also a veteran of the Korean War and a bomber pilot in Vietnam. In 1958, tragedy struck the Doolittle family, the kind that leaves a parent asking unanswered questions for the rest of their life. Jim Jr. committed suicide. There was no note and never an explanation. Because of his military record and scientific background, Jimmy became chairman of the Air Force Scientific Board. He had the ability and know how to bring both sides together. From 1955 to 1965, he was a member of the President's Advisory Board on Foreign Intelligence. He was offered the job of heading up the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA. He declined that job. That wasn't the only distinction Jim turned down. The city of Los Angeles wanted the name LAX after him. And he declined that offer, saying that most airports were named after deceased people and he wasn't quite ready to make that sacrifice yet. In 1985, Congress promoted James Harold Doolittle to the rank of full general. That's four stars. President Ronald Reagan and Senator Barry Goldwater had the honor of pinning those stars on his shoulders. In North Africa, in 1943, it was decided to establish a yearly reunion for the Doolittle Raiders. The first official reunion was held in Miami, Florida, 1945. The citizens of Tucson, Arizona had presented Doolittle with 80 silver goblets in a display case, one for each Raider on the mission, which he in turn gave to the Air Force Academy for safekeeping. Each year, the Raiders toast the men who died on the raid and members who passed away during the year. The deceased men's goblets are turned upside down in the display case. Their names had been inscribed on the goblets twice, right side up and upside down, so it can always be read. In 1993, Jim Doolittle's silver goblet was turned over. He passed away September 27, Pebble Beach, California. He was 96 years old. He was buried at Arlington National Cemetery next to his wife, Jo. Among some of the awards and medals America bestowed on Jimmy Doolittle are the Horatio Alger Award, the Medal of Freedom, two Air Medals, 
two distinguished service medals. Three distinguished flying crosses. Bronze Star. Silver Star. And the Medal of Honor. The countries of Great Britain, France, China, Bolivia, Belgium, Poland, Ecuador, all decorated Jimmy Doolittle with their highest awards. One of Jim's philosophies is that after all the speeches, words of wisdom, and advice is given, you lead by example, not words. He is the only person in the history of the United States to win both its highest military honor, the Medal of Honor, and its highest civilian honor, the Medal of Freedom. Now that's leading by example.